40 years, Martha Wash's powerful voice has been a staple on dance floors around the world. A career that has had its share of ups, downs, and even scandal. She's here on Black Music Archive to tell her story. Born in the Bay Area of Northern California, it was at an early age that Martha discovered that she had a voice. I started singing when I was three years old. My godmother told my mother that I was singing in the back seat of a car. My mother, who loved to sing, sang in the church choir, so she was the one who really encouraged me to sing. Sang in the church choir, played for the youth choir. I had music all through elementary school, junior high, and high school. And it was in high school that Martha began her official recording career as part of the Polytechnic High School Choir. Our high school recorded a four albums, which was totally unheard of. Nobody, no school anywhere had recorded albums. I'm not going to say just for the sake of recording albums, but our teacher really encouraged us. And we went to Europe for about a month or so and was singing around uh, Europe. So that was something just totally, um, totally new. Uh, I'm sure it's nothing new now, but during that time in an urban school on top of that, you know, but we had the support of the school, uh, our parents, uh, even the mayor of the city at that time. So it was something really, really special for us. Just seem like we can't do right. Look how we treated you. But please so forgive us, Lord. Also, when I was in high school, um, I was just getting ready to start learning uh, classical music uh, with a private teacher. Unfortunately, uh, I think I was maybe less than a year into uh, the classes and uh, she passed away. So I did not continue on with uh, learning the classical music. Okay, so were you training as a mezzo or as a soprano or you didn't get there yet? Um, I'm trying to remember. As, as a soprano, as a soprano, the thing was she didn't want me to sing gospel music and learn classical music. Uh, sing classical music at the same time. And I said, well, that's kind of hard for me because I have to sing gospel music. I belong to a gospel church and I sing in the choirs and things. So she compromised, you know, she said, okay, go ahead. Just don't sing it as hard as you would naturally. I said, okay, fine. Her next recordings will be with the San Francisco Inspirational Choir. And it was through this choir that she would meet another powerhouse vocalist. Isora Rhodes. She was a uh, she was a member of that choir. They were recording an album at the time. I sang in a totally different gospel choir, but we we would all sing together at uh, different church services. We would have musicals once a month, so everybody knew everybody. So uh, Donnell asked me to come in and sing with the choir. And I did a little bit of work on one of the songs that he uh, that he was recording at the time. So, yeah. OK. And was it through your choir work that you were able to link up with Sylvester? No, <laughs> um, I got a phone call regarding Sylvester uh, to they let me know that there was a audition going on at a particular address and maybe that I should check it out. Well, I assumed it was for uh, auditioning for, say, a studio session singer, something like that. And I went in and come to find out it was as a to audition as a background singer for Sylvester. I knew of him two years earlier because he was the opening act for Billy Preston, who I was a huge fan of. And so when I saw Sylvester for the first time, I was saying, oh my God, who is this guy? I had never heard anybody like him. Um, I, it was, his sound was just so different for me. And the band was great. And uh, 
So I just kind of put him in the back of my mind. Fast forward two years later, I'm standing in front of him. And I told him that I had seen him at uh, Billy's uh, show. So he told me to go on and sing a song. After it was over, the two girls, uh, white thin girls that had were there before me uh, and had auditioned, he told them to leave. So, and we talked and he asked me if, I knew of anybody that was as large as I was and that couldn't sing. And I said, yeah. And I brought in um, Isora. So that's really basically how it started off. And the rest went on to be history. Sylvester, along with Martha and Isora, who he dubbed the two tons of fun, would take the world by storm, bringing the sounds of the black church to the floors of dance clubs everywhere. Never one to hide the talent of his backing singers, Sylvester always gave them a chance to shine. And with moments like this, It was only a matter of time before Martha and Dizora would venture out on their own. How did you guys end up recording your own, uh, I guess, what they be considered solo albums as two tons? Mm -hmm. How did you guys do that? Harvey Fuqua, uh, in fact, was the one that said, you guys need to record your own album. And we said, OK, it did. It did well on the charts. We had some hits on there that they're still playing today, especially Just Us. Uh, I think that one and um, I think, ooh, I got the feeling. Uh, those two were, were, were big for us. With songs such as Just Us, I Got the Feeling and Make Someone Feel Happy Today. Two tons quickly became staples on the dance charts and in the dance clubs. But the hidden gem among all of these songs is actually a ballad, taking away your space. And that I'm to take away your space. You know, I always wondered how much did it cost them to replace the roof after you sang Taking Away Your Space? That is one of the greatest <laughs> vocals of all time. Like I, I thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, Sylvester and Harvey wrote that song. And um, Harvey gave it to me and said, just sing. And I just put my feelings on it. What am I gonna do? And that was it. So in the between the last two tons of fun, I mean, there's like an interim period. I know you guys leave Sylvester. Mm -hmm. So what spurred the name change from two tons to the weather girls? It all had to do with the song, It's Raining Men. If you listen to the beginning of the song, it says, hi, we're your weather girls. Hi, hi, we're your weather girls. Uh -huh. And have we got news for you. And when the song came out, uh, there was this, this big um, conversation, I'll say, about who the weather girls were. Some people were saying it was a new group called the Weather Girls. Others who knew of Isora and myself said, no, that's more than Isora. That's two tons of fun. When Paul uh, decided to deal with uh, Columbia Records and the other production company, um, we were offered a contract. And so we decided to 
change our names to the Weather Girls, uh, move from the West Coast to the East Coast, and in a way, just kind of start all over again. Speaking of that soul, I do know it had been shopped around for some years prior to that. How did you guys end up with it? Uh, Paul Jabara, who <laughs> who wrote the song, him and Paul Schaefer, and uh, he at, literally begged us to record the song. He got us to his home under false pretenses and um, <laughs> gave us lunch and then said, I want you to hear this song. And it was his rainy men. And he said, I want you to record the song. And I kind of looked at Isaiah and I said, you got to be kidding. He said, no. He said, I need you to record the song. He said, the share turned it down. Barbara Streisand turned it down. Diana Ross turned it down. Donna Summer turned it down. And he said, I know this song is going to be a hit. He kept saying that. And for all intents and purposes, the song was finished. All it needed was the lead vocals, basically. And so we kind of said, okay, Paul, all right. You know, kind of like doing him a favor and stuff. And we went in the studio and uh, recorded the song probably a couple of days later and walked out of the studio and said, okay, see you later. We're gone. And then that was it. And we went on and continued doing what we were doing and, and working and stuff. And it really started out as a big, big hit in the clubs, in the underground clubs and, and you know, at long, long, long before uh, mainstream radio even picked up on it. It's Raining Men would be a worldwide hit, selling over 6 million copies, making the Weather Girls international superstars. Their follow-up releases will fall short in matching the success of their predecessors. Was there any shift between like the Weather Girls and Columbia between uh, those two albums? Because they're sort of day and night in terms of how... Uh, Just different producers, mm -hmm. I would say. While continuing her work as a Weather Girl, Wash was also establishing herself as one of the top session singers in the business. Her ad libs were sending songs to the top of the charts, one of them being Reby Jackson's Centipede. A song that she was personally requested to sing by Michael Jackson. Well, that was kind of a um, what is, I want to say like a command appearance because Michael Jackson asked for us and um, we went into the studio and um, did those vocals for him for the Centipede song and um, that's basically it. Centipede would be one of many songs at the top of the charts that featured Wash's vocals. It would also be among the first of many music videos that will feature Wash's vocals without featuring Wash herself. This will culminate in her being the voice behind some of the biggest hits of the early 90s, such as Black Box's Everybody Everybody, and CNC Music Factory's Gonna Make You Sweat. Everybody dance now! Where in both instances, thin models lip synced over Wash's voice. The scandal would shake the entire music industry and lead to a discussion on what is considered beautiful, not just in music, but in society. 
In California, I just met two talented ladies who always thought big was beautiful and fat was fun. We've seen more large women at our shows that have spoken to us and they say, well, we're very glad to see that you're, you know, you're out there. And they, they feel very happy about it. Going back to their days as the two tons, music listeners and critics praised Martha and Nizora for redefining beauty standards and music. But as Martha would reveal, for all the praise that they received, they got just as much backlash. When you guys are with Sylvester or release work as two tons of fun, and even the what early Weather Girls reviews, a lot of women were saying you guys were like, uh, they were like happy to see themselves represented. They saw themselves in you. A lot of writers and people were praising you guys and saying like, you know, they are redefining beauty standards. You know, it, it was a lot of body positive comments. Do you? Mm, oh. Not necessarily. Oh. Really? Now, no. From artists, I'll say, or people that knew us that were in the industry, yes. Mm. Still from people that ran the companies, not necessarily at a point it sometimes it was like okay well still how do we market i'm going back to izora and myself how do we market them market us because we're we're singers we can sing we we put out some good music you know make it make it work it's gotten better and i'm happy i'm and i'm definitely happy about it but i've always felt that talent was last on the line it was you know it wasn't number one wasn't number two maybe even not even number three and you also have you you have to be a triple threat you have to be a triple threat no you don't if you if what you do is sing and you move people enough you don't have to dance for your life you know what i'm saying or do these other things but the more you can do the more we can make off of you wash would eventually sue major record labels sony and rca she'd win her case receiving not just proper credit and compensation for her contribution to these records but also her very own record deal as a solo artist and in the winter of 1993, she'd release her self-titled debut album. So the Martha Wash album, mm -hmm. what was that experience like recording? What was the experience recording that album like for you? It was fine. It was fine. Um, uh, Brian Alexander Morgan. He wrote uh, some of the tunes for the for the album, and I think it came out very very well. We got a couple of hits off of it, you know, so I was happy about that. The only problem was I didn't get a chance to go out and promote it as much as I had wanted to because um, our first promotional stop was in Chicago. Well, I made it to Chicago, but I didn't get to do the show or the listening party, that whole kind of thing, because I wound up getting in an accident like the day before we were supposed to start. And so I had to come back home. I was laid up for about three months or so. I uh, hurt my knee. So that kind of put a, a, a squash on really trying to promote the first album. <laughs> Even without Martha being able to promote it, the record would yield three top 10 dance singles, including two number ones, Carry On and Give It To You. This would set Martha up to release what would have been a highly anticipated follow-up album. Uh, RCA went through some changes. Um, and BMG and all of that. 
And so they moved me to a dance label of theirs. And then they closed down that label and that left me with no label. So, hey, I started my own. And it was some years, I have to say. So I was kind of, uh, I'll say floundering for a while, uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And so I just decided I was going to start my own label, you know, just my own little imprint and put out music whenever I wanted to. Under her own imprint, Wash has released four top 10 singles. The most recent being Don't Stop Me Now with her new group, The First Ladies of Disco. A diva supergroup comprised of Wash, Norman Jean Wright of Chic, and Linda Clifford. I have a group called uh, First Ladies of Disco. And we've been, uh, we had two singles, two hit singles on the Billboard dance charts uh, in the top 10, which we were very, very happy about that uh, because we're known as legacy artists. You know, we've been here for a while, but uh, still relevant, still working, and uh, still trying to bring positivity to people. And just knowing that we could get to the top 10 on the charts up against Madonna, Cher, and Beyonce, and whoever else was out during that time, that felt really, really good for us uh, and for the label and everything. So we just keep pushing on. Being a part of a group has not steered Martha away from continuing her work as a solo artist, as she still to this day continues to stretch herself musically and creatively. You know, you've been trying a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like, what is Martha Wash going to try next? <laughs> Good question. Um, I'm still hoping I, I still want to do the gospel album. I still definitely want to do the gospel album because that is uh, the root for me as far as my foundation and singing is concerned. But I have always said, and I will always continue to say, I'm not going to be put into a box. People who grew up with my music mostly just think of me as a dance music artist because that's how I started. That's how I'm not going to end up as. Uh, I will always continue to find different types of music because I've always loved different kinds of music. Again, listening to gospel music as a child is my foundation, but as a teenager and listening to music under my pillow, I was listening to the Motown sound, Aretha Franklin. I was listening to rock bands. On TV, I was looking at and listening to uh, the golden era of big band music. So I like that as well. I'm not going to be put into a box and said, that's the only kind of music that you can perform. Now, what I'm asking is for the fans to come on the journey with me. A lot of times I have gotten feedback from people who said when they listened to the Love and Conflict album, they said, I don't like this album. I'm not sure about this album. When are you going to put out some dance music? Well, I mean, that's that's the safety net is the dance music because everybody knows me from doing it. Well, I'm a little bit older now. I've been through a couple of things in my life. You know what I'm saying? So the dancing and everything is fine. Sometimes you have to sit your ass down and think and listen and feel something different than the thumper, thumper, thumper. If you know anything about Martha's music, you'd be able to hear that her love for all music genres has always been present throughout her career. 
whether she was bringing the opera to disco. Using jazzy scats for the dance floor. Or paying homage to the great divas of the blues. God bless the child that's got his own. That's God he has always showcased her versatility as an artist. Now, getting back to that person that said they didn't like the album. They came back around and said, I listened to your album again. And you know what? I like it. So sometimes we all have to listen more than once to really get it. Sometimes it takes us more than once, more than twice, even more than three times. That's okay. As long as the person gets something from those songs, it speaks to them in whatever kind of way it needs to speak to them. It inspires them in whatever kind of way it needs to inspire them. Then I'm cool. Any last things you want to say to the viewers? that I appreciate everybody's support and to please continue to support indie artists because it's not, uh, it's not easy when you're an indie artist and you don't have the machine of these record companies to help you. So whenever you can support them as much as possible, that's, I mean, that's the best that I can say. And I really, really love you for, for those of you that started all the way back in the seventies, I love you because we're still here. You know, and for the new fans that are following, uh, just getting to know me a little bit. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> I love, thank you so much, Miss Wash. Um, have thank a great you. day. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.